guess we could get Carson High since that's right along the way. San Marica Hall was a, a hall that used to be in that spot and that was the very first hall where we threw our own party. When I say we threw our own party, we rented the hall, we got all the groups together to, to guest DJ and be a part of this party. We made the flyers hand-drawn. They were all hand-drawn flyers. We promoted. We let people know. All the parties that we would DJ at, we would let them know that the party was going on Friday night at San Marica Hall. That was the first time we ever threw our own party and charged at the door and made money and it, it spawned our legend promotions. My name is Isaiah Dacio Jr., also known as DJ Icy Ice. Born and raised here in Carson, California, and I'm a DJ. We got Icy Ice in the house! Drop it! Growing up in a big Filipino community like Carson, it was amazing because I was just around my culture. I'm an my parents did a good job of like always bringing me around to family parties and to friends and you know just being around other Filipinos period but I went to school with Filipinos my best friends are Filipino and it was just amazing because it just felt like home but the the nice thing about Carson was it was also multicultural Carson is also one of those cities in Los Angeles one of the most culturally diverse in all of California as far as uh, you know, Filipinos, Samoans, Latinos, African Americans, Asians, and Caucasians. So like, I had a good mix of being in a pocket of Filipinos, but I also, also experienced a lot of different cultures at the same time. So growing up in a melting pot in an environment like the city of Carson, it was a good mix of cultures and then I was also at home with being around a lot of Filipinos. But the cool thing about it was a thing called hip hop was born around that time and I was exposed early on. I would walk to school and I see the graffiti art on the walls. I go to lunch break and then you would see people b-boying or you would see them rapping or kind of like freestyling against each other. It was very influential, especially when I went to my very first dance that I, I went to at uh, middle school. It influenced me a lot because that was my very first time I saw an, an actual DJ for the first time live. That experience of lining up outside of the hall you're paying your money to get in, and then the minute you go in, it's a dark hall. You make your way into that hall, and then all of a sudden, you just see bright lights, booming sound system, you see a DJ right there in the middle of the stage, and I was just mesmerized. I was just blown away because I'm like, wow, that guy's really DJing for the very first time. And so that influenced me in a big way. That, 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 that was pretty much the seed of what got me started to be to wanting to become a DJ. From what I remember uh, growing up, you know, I, I always got that work ethic from my parents. Seeing them work hard, you know, uh, my mom would work late night shifts, and then my dad would work the daytime. Someone was always home with me and my sister when we were growing up. My dad was always working up until five o'clock and then about five o'clock my mom was taking off. Yeah, I know that they worked hard um, early on, especially when we lived in Ladera. Like it was just a small little two bedroom home that we, we grew out of. Actually, I was the only child at that point. And then we finally made our move over here to Carson. Hi, I'm Marietta, mother of Didi Ice Ice. I'm Isaiah Dasho Senior, father of uh, Isaiah Ice, Ice Junior. We came here in America to find a better life, but I started uh, in a very low uh, 
kind of work because I don't have a car, we don't we have a little money. Uh, but uh, America is uh, it's like a heaven when uh, you come from the Philippines. That's why I wanted to raise my family over here. We had a bad start here because I was pregnant then with John. Mm -hmm. And I start bleeding, so I wasn't able to work for four months. And after that, the doctor advised me to stay longer until I'm gonna have him. So it is really a bad start. He's the only one making, you know, just to do something. To, to 25 per hour. Yeah, because he wasn't able to land his job right away. You know, that's how we started. I didn't know it at the time, but. You know, I know that my parents uh, were kind of struggling also. They, they worked hard and, um, you know, we didn't take lavish vacations or we didn't go anywhere. We went camping or we, uh, we didn't really stay in fancy hotels when we went to Las Vegas. We slept in the van. <laughs> um, but, you know, like we were happy. We were happy as a family. Um, they always had joy. We went to the Grand Canyon or we, we traveled to multiple states. Um, my parents did a good job of uh, taking us and exposing us to just different cultures, different uh, places and seeing different things. John is the good boy. He loves music. He started playing the violin at kindergarten and he was doing good. But when he he started going to school in Carson High. He was um, playing the saxophone. He was in the band. Yeah, music's always been a big part of my life uh, from the very first time I can remember back to kindergarten um, when we were still living in La Tijera Park, like over there in Ladera. Man, um, one of the music teachers over there pulled me aside and, and um, took me under his wing to teach me the violin. And then I was actually playing the violin and being featured part of his orchestra and his show for the school way back then. And um, I was always a shy kid though, like I, I was introvert, very soft-spoken, didn't say much, but music kind of like helped me grow and music helped me express myself and music helped me become the person I am today. I, I wanted him to be uh, like an architect also or fine arts, but uh, you know, he, he, he went into music. He finished management and he mm -hmm. went on communication at uh, mm -hmm. Cal State Dominguez. Mm -hmm. But one more semester, he don't want to finish it anymore. <laughs> he focused on all these DJs. I'm glad he's making money too. Yeah. Man, growing up over here, all my friends grew up and majority of them became a gang um, but I lived right next door to the, the, the leader <laughs> I lived right next door to the leader who lived at that house and he would always hear me practicing especially when I had my equipment in the garage um, he would always hear me practicing come hang out um, but I think they, they knew that my path was music and they, they knew that I wasn't um, I wasn't gonna you know, join the, the guys or anything like that. So um, they, they let me do my thing and they, you know, like whenever I wanted to hang with them or anything like that, they told me to just go, go do your thing. <laughs> so they kind of just pushed me away from being down with the gang. So back there, the first hall I ever DJed at was Powers Hall. And that's exactly what I was explaining to you in the story was, at that hall, that was the very first time I went to my first dance. That inspired me to become a DJ. And from that point, I worked my way up to becoming the DJ on stage and playing for all my peers and all my classmates and all of that. And so I have a lot of history and a lot of my roots come from being and starting right here. So how I, how I got my first pair of turntables it was actually, I got one turntable. And so um, I came home from that, that junior high dance and I said I wanted to become a DJ. And so my dad 
and my mom, uh, they were like, why you want such an expensive turntable? Because turntables at that time was only less than a hundred bucks, but I wanted a technique turntable. I wanted the top of the line. And this thing was 300 plus for a turntable. And so mom, dad made me work for it. <laughs> so I helped my dad help clean out like at some of our, our property, our, our rental properties or whatever at the apartment, I, I help clean, I help, um, you know, I help paint and do different things to work my way to getting that one turntable. And then my neighbor up the street, Alex, he saved up cutting lawns, doing work with his dad, and then he got his, his turntable. And then my other friend, Anthony, down the street, he got the mixer. So the three of us combined, we got our first pair of two turntables and a mixer working together. So with Carson High, again, just like middle school, it was just on another level. Um, I would DJ like the, the, the parties here. They had lunch dances where we would just, you would just dance for like the lunch period and then boom, off to class. Um, they would have outdoor pep rallies, you know, especially on Fridays on football, football game days and I would DJ those things. But I think the coolest thing, the coolest thing that happened was I was still a 10th grader here at school and I got excused from class. I got excused for my last three periods of class to get my equipment at home, to go set up for these things and then uh, play. And so that was a, an ongoing thing. Anytime it was football games, anytime it was whatever, I would get excused to DJ. House parties was all I did when I first got started. <laughs> My first gig was a house party. It was a, a, a 16 year old birthday party over in Torrance. It wasn't anything glamorous or anything like that. That party really sucked if you look at it in today's sense, but but it was a house party and um, it was my first party that I ever DJed and it was dope. But house parties to me were like the best, man. House parties, just the vibe, the energy, you're packed into a garage or you're packed into a living room and just, I think because it's just so compact and tight and it's dark and it's sweaty and um, just people enjoy the vibe, the energy and, it's, and the music bumping. House parties are the best. So when we got started, it was just all fun. A lot of the guys that I, I grew up with, they all be, we all became a crew, we all became Legend Entertainment. But even before we became Legend Entertainment, I kind of um, started under, under a guy named Jimmy Corpus and his, his crew was Spectrum. And that was the very, very first crew that I was uh, really officially a part of. But all the guys I grew up with, we officially were part of Spectrum first, and then we eventually broke away and started our own crew called Legend. And in those days, it was just fun. We were all high schoolers. We were just starting to learn how to drive. Uh, we would do the parties, try and meet girls, you know, just do whatever we can to, to have fun DJing. Any little money that we made from our gigs, we reinvested into records, into more equipment, into everything. So yes, my parents helped me get the one turntable, but then from that it spawned into, you know, a whole DJ system. Crates and crates and hundreds of crates of records into full DJ lighting, sound, everything. That one little turntable, the help that they gave me, they, they supported me in that, it, it helped me blossom into, into becoming a full-fledged DJ. As we got into the industry, as, uh, as radio came into play, radio was huge, huge in the, in the 90s. Um, we didn't have any social media, we didn't have any Spotify, we didn't have any of, it was only TV and radio. That was your only two exposures to, to um, anything. 
And so we definitely didn't have representation as Filipinos in TV. So it was a huge deal for any kind of representation for Filipinos to be in radio. And so E-Man was the very first guy to make it on radio out of our Filipino community here in Los Angeles. And he made it on a Power 106. And funny thing is I, I was with him the day he tried out or when he did his audition mix on Power 106. And yeah, E-Man made it first. And then within a year later, I made it over on 92.3 The Beat. E-Man was, a, he was actually trying to bring me in over at Power 106, but that didn't work out, and then Julio G gave me my, my break at 92.3 to beat. Did you understand how, what big of a market you were going into when you got, no. you got to 92? I didn't understand that at all. I just knew I grew up in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles was just Los Angeles to me. I didn't know that it was the number two market in the US. I didn't know the significance of New York and LA being major media markets. I didn't understand any of that. I didn't know that LA was an entertainment capital, <laughs> not just in movies and film, TV, but in radio as well and in music especially. I didn't know any of that going into it. I was just having fun. Uh, we looked at radio as a big, big opportunity, and, and when we had that opportunity to make it on radio, we treated it as fun as well. People work hard to make their way into a major market. You know, if you grew up in Sacramento, or if you grew up in the Midwest or whatever, people work hard and they work in a lot of different positions to work their way into getting into New York or Los Angeles. but. Yeah, man, I lucked out. The moment I felt like I kind of made it in those early years was I was telling you about how I, I went to my first junior high dance. And within a year and a half, two years, I got my equipment, the crew did everything. That moment was me standing on that stage, but DJing for that same crowd. So I wasn't the guy down there looking up, I was the guy on stage DJing for the crowd. So that was that first moment for me. I, it was still junior high, it was still Carnegie Junior High, but that was a big, big deal for me. The Beach Junkies are a group of friends, first and foremost, but I guess in everybody's eyes, we're a group of turntablists. We are a group of DJs that love and just want to push forward the, the, the turntable and DJ culture. And so we love the art of it, and we love the performance aspect of it. We love to just uh, look at ourselves as a group that just um, push the DJ culture forward. Being part of the Beat Junkies, it was, it was just, a, again, a fun thing. We were all friends. We were all friends and homies, and we all hung out before we became a crew, before we actually solidified ourselves as a crew. And so, yeah, a lot of those days early on was me going over to Rhett's house, me and Rhett going over and idolizing Curse. And Curse and DJ What were like the, the guys that were rocking the clubs and then we tag along and just go watch them. And yeah, a lot of that was just all just friends hanging out, friends being with friends, us going record shopping with each other and all of that. So it all just came together because we were all homies and friends first.
With the progression of the DJ culture, uh, it's been amazing to be able to be a part of it from the beginning and, uh, and, and see it grow. DJing was always still around even before us in the 80s, even into the 70s, people were DJing. But I think the turntable culture, like turntable lists, you know, DJs using music and manipulating music and cutting, scratching, um, remixing music live in front of an audience, that, that's all brand new. And we've been able to be part of that. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of that. And um, that progression was a gradual progression, but you can see like uh, from what it, it's become from the 90s, from when we started Beat Junkies to where it is today, it's, it's just grown leaps and bounds. It's just amazing. I don't think there's any secret to longevity, but I think uh, one key to it is just being a good person, period. If you're a jerk or you're an a-hole, like, you're not going to last in this business. If you're in this business for the wrong reasons, you're just out to get girls, you're just out for the notoriety or whatever, then, yeah, you're not going to last as a DJ. But I think one of the keys is in being a DJ is uh, yes, just being a good person. Another key I think I would add on to that is having work ethic as well. Um, there's a lot of super talented DJs, but they're just lazy. And so work will beat lazy any time of the week. You could be the most talented person in the world, but if you're not working toward mastering your craft, working to improving yourself, working to just um, be better in your performance, in your art, in whatever you're doing, then you're not gonna last. We got icy ice in the house, drop it! But that little hobby became my passion. It became my voice, what I do as a career nowadays. Do you think you got the mentality because you saw your friends work so hard? I believe I got that mentality because yes, I saw my parents work hard, they struggled, they had to work for everything that they had from moving to this country, from the Philippines, to, to making it. And so in those early years, they were struggling. But as they got their footing in, the, in America, uh, they got it. They figured it out. I, I couldn't even imagine leaving my family in the Philippines at a young age moving across the country, I mean, across the ocean, and not knowing anybody here except maybe one family member. And that one family member letting you stay here for, uh, well, stay with them until you get your first job and get your first paychecks so you, you could afford your first apartment. And then from there, you scrape, you, you, you do what you gotta do. My dad's graduated as, as an architect, but he worked as a janitor over here in the, in the US. It, it, it's, it was just a constant struggle to make it. But they struggled so then I could do what I do. Of course, they wanted me to go in this path of being a doctor, a professional, a lawyer, engineer. Of all things, I picked being a DJ. <laughs> and um, they didn't understand it for the longest time, but they supported me. They had my back. In my rise as being a DJ, we would promote parties, we'd have uh, promoter meetings, we would, I'd have the crew over at my house all the time. So on a given night, not at this house, but at our house uh, when we were living in Gardena, I'd have 50, 60 people for a promoter meeting at my house every Monday night. And I, I would just set up rows and rows of chairs and then people outside of our patio and pe in our backyard with the windows open just so they can hear what we were doing, what club we were promoting, what spots we needed to hit, all of that stuff. Like it was just a whole type of thing. But yeah, like um, they supported me. They never questioned me. They never said, get all these kids out of my house. Um, they supported me 100% in that pursuit of my love and my passion for DJing. Making in America, they, 
they strive to make inroads for me and because of their sacrifices I'm able to do what I do and open doors for others and and um, love the whole process and enjoy it and be here to be able to share that with you today.